Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I remember it was a hot day in July 1974 when my mother, after seeing some broken glass in the kitchen floor, asked me whether I broke any glass. And I said, no. But she insisted. She told me not to lie to her and tell her the truth. But very soon, we discovered a stray dum dum bullet sitting on the worktop of the kitchen and a small hole in the kitchen window. Those explained the broken glass. We woke up my father, who was a policeman at that time, one day before having the uh, night shift. I remember his face. He had a very worried look on his face when he saw the bullet. He went out for shopping that day and he came home, stockpiled dry food and canned food and told me not to leave the house. A few days later, the war started. I remember the two soldiers from our side who came and knocked on our door as well as the um, neighbor's door telling us that the enemy soldiers are only 100 meters away, that we have to vacate the house and escape and flee. I remember very vividly how my sleepers were coming out of my feet when I was running together with my mother, my elder brother, and the neighbors towards the next safe haven, which was the basement of a primary school. I remember the unending sounds of gunshots and bombs, like tu 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 boom, tu 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 boom, tu 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 boom, all day and night long in those days. I remember the very same night when we were in that primary school basement, when again soldiers from our side came and took my brother, who was only 15 telling my crying mother that he wouldn't be given a gun to fight, but he will help filling the sandbags for the shelters, for the fighting soldiers. Among those sounds of gunshots and um, bombs, one day after a sound of a gunshot, I decided to play, to, to play a trick on my mother. After the sound of a gunshot, I cried out, ah, as if I was shot. And my mother rushed into the room in heart beating. Here I was, standing there with a freaking silly grin on my face. What a schmuck I was. I think it was the first time, but definitely the last time that my mother slapped me on my face. And I truly deserved it, let me tell you that. During the post-war months, we the kids used to play with live bullets, which were abundant in those times, hundreds of them. We used to take off the head of the bullets, make necklaces out of them, and we would use the gunpowder, explode the, uh, the rest, or sometimes even burn our names with the gunpowder. But I'll tell you what, folks. What I had to go through in those during the, uh, the war days, is not even close to what some people who lost their loved ones had to go through. My experience was nothing. Now, why am I sharing this experience with you? Because partly those events and memories shape the way I am today, shape the ideas I have today on world events and more specifically on war and in a way, partly paved the way for me to become a peace activist as, as I am today. Now, today I'm going to talk about power of ideas in preventing wars and peace building. I have always been fascinated by the very link, the very interaction between world events and ideas. Is it the world events which shape ideas, or is it the ideas which shape world events? I think it's an interactive process, but therefore the ideas are very important. 
I think that with the right ideas, we can shape events towards a peaceful future. But likewise, some ideas, even scientifically not proven or based on ungrounded arguments, if they are used in the right place and the right time, they can become self-fulfilling prophecies. In 1993, I was studying international relations as a master's student when I first read um, Samuel Huntington's famous article called Clash of Civilizations. Here, Huntington talks about that <clears throat> future wars will take place between people who belong to different civilizations. Basically, what Huntington is saying to us is that people who belong to different civilizations, when they come into contact, they are doomed to clash. Huntington divides the world population into seven or eight civilizations, like Western civilization, Confucian civilization, Islamic civilization, and whatnot. But you know what? He himself was not sure whether there are seven or eight civilizations in the world. For him, eighth civilization was, and I quote, possibly African civilization, unquote. Possibly African civilization? My first reaction when I read this article was, you know, to tell you the truth, I felt like puking on it, and I threw it away. But I felt very angry and worried after reading that article. And I'll tell you why I, I felt angry and worried after reading that article. Because there I saw the power of ideas, although based on ungrounded arguments, to become self-fulfilling prophecies. I was worried and angry because Huntington was an established professor of international relations. His article came out in a very influential journal called Foreign Affairs, which is widely read by both scholars and practitioners. And let's face it, folks, whatever we read, whatever ideas we read, we get influenced by them. That's exactly why I was so angry and worried. And you know what happened, especially after the 9-11 events, September 11, 2001 events, unfortunately that clash of civilization argument became widely popular all around the world. Now what I'm telling you is this, similar to that, what we should do is, we should promote ideas like what, for example, Immanuel Kant in 1795 called perpetual peace. Perpetual peace is a state of affairs where peace is permanently established on a region. And ideally, of course, on the whole world. But then you might ask me, how do we reach perpetual peace? Well, some years ago, through my own peace-building experience on the ground, I found out that I was not a superman. It is sad, right? Yes. But I also found out that establishing peace, one case at a time, one community at a time, is possible. And this is exactly what we should do. We should stop being depressed about not being a superman, but we should constantly rethink about new ideas or how to establish peace in our own community, regenerate new ideas, spread them, test them, My actual peace-building experience goes more than 20 years ago. That's when I started crossing to the other side. And it coincided with my graduate studies in international relations with an emphasis on um, peace-building and conflict resolution. Now I look back, I see that my urge to be involved in peace building, be a peace activist, was partly coming from those 1974 war days, my experience, but partly also coming from my own fascination 
with the mission of the discipline of international relations. You know, the mission, the, the, the discipline of international relations was established after World War I with a very honorable mission. And the mission was to scientifically study ways to find ways to prevent wars taking place. Now, isn't that a very honorable mission? Today, I'm, I feel very proud to be a member of this discipline. And you know, although I am a professor of international relations, I consider myself as an eternal student of international relations. You know why? Because the excitement is in being a student, because being a student is, it means that you are constantly exposed to new ideas, you are challenged by new ideas, you generate new ideas, you spread them, you test them. So it's a constant rethinking, um, regenerating and reacting. Now, now that I look back retrospectively, what I can tell you is this. Wars need to be prevented in all costs. Let me repeat for those who cannot understand. Wars need to be prevented in all costs. Now, with the rise of the nation state after the Treaty of Westphalia, following the Thirty Years' War, and more symbolically after the French Revolution, what we have been witnessing was basically wars that are taking place between states, between nation states. But there is also a clear trend after the end of World War II that the number of interstate wars are decreasing, but there is an increase in the number of intrastate wars, meaning wars in differing intensity within states who call themselves nation states. Now, what is a nation state? Well, a nation state is an independent state which is inhabited by the people of one nation and one nation only. Well, what if there are people, groups of people, who belong to different ethnicity and religion or sect or linguistic group who do not identify themselves with as belonging to the nation? Sounds familiar? I bet it does. Now, without getting into too much detail, what I want to tell you is this. Main reason for most of these intrastate wars, meaning these conflicts which are taking place in one state, are mostly because of the fact that the dominant group in that state tries to impose that nation state paradigm on the rest of the people. Let me cut to the chase. What we need to do is, in order to solve such problems and respond to these intrastate wars, we need to come up with models of governance that goes beyond the nation state paradigm, that challenges the nation state paradigm. What I'm saying is this, we have to come up with ideas, we have to rethink, regenerate all the time, new ideas, new governance models, which is based on power sharing and peaceful coexistence of people belonging to different ethnicity, religion, linguistic groups or whatever, constantly. That's the only way that we can get rid of this. For example, in 1969, Famous political scientist Aaron Lippard came up with the idea of a consociational democracy, which is based on power sharing among different ethnic or religious groups. Similar to that, that's what we need to strive for. Today, the sectarian conflict in Iraq and after the Arab uprisings, violent conflicts in Syria, and Egypt demonstrate as yet that 
we are faced with even a more urgent need to come up with models of power sharing that can help us to keep these states intact. Now, preventing wars is not enough, of course. An absence of war does not mean peace, but it's a good start. It is a good start. Establishing peace one case at a time, one community at a time, is what we need to do by constantly rethinking, regenerating new ideas so that we can shape the minds of people and orient them towards perpetual peace. As the 17th century philosopher Baruch de Spinoza said, peace is not absence of war, but a virtue that comes from the strength of mind. So let's continue strengthening our minds towards building peace, starting in our own community. And for my part, I am fully determined to continue contributing to peace building in my own community until my last breath. How about you? Thank you.